Well, good evening to all of you. Once again, it is a joy to get to sing praises to our mighty King. Hasn't this been so refreshing? I was talking with one of the gentlemen earlier, and I said, no offense to any conference out there or that has been. There's been a lot of good ones, and I am all for uh, dealing with tough issues, calling out false teaching. Sometimes you got to have a conference and get in the trenches, and things get a little messy, and uh, smoke flies, and sparks fly, and Twitter flies, and everything else after and during the conference. But when I saw the theme for this conference, I just remember thinking, Oh, that's got to be good for the soul. Amen? Just Christ. You go home, and instead of feeling like you were in the middle of a, a mudslinging war, you go home and you feel purified and encouraged and full of joy. Uh, there are times for battle. We know this. Uh, but there are moments of reprieve where you drink from the well of Christ. And that has been this. Uh, I had plans, you know, during certain breaks to maybe rest or study or do other things, and I felt compelled each and every session. I just found myself glued to the next one. Uh, at one point, I went to the back and I said, I'm going to study and get a few things done this hour. I've got a shepherd, I've got to call home, and eventually I heard one of the men on the television keep going, and I thought, ah, I've got to listen to this session too. It's too good. <laughs> it's been so good. In this final uh, session for today, my assignment is to preach Christ our Life, And so I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, chapter 4. We're going to be in verses 17 to 24, and we'll read together in just a moment. I selected this text because as I prayed and thought about what might be fitting for Christ our life, I began to think about our life before Christ, and mine in particular, and the way that things were before Christ took over before he changed my heart. I'm sure you could think about the same thing and go down memory lane, not to relish too much in your sin or, or your BC days before Christ, but it is good to remember where he has brought you from. And Paul the Apostle aims to help the Ephesians meditate on their life in Christ, live according to their new life in Christ. And to do that, uh, he takes aim at their past and, in a way, pulls them from uh, kind of the view to a higher vantage point, almost from ground level to a balcony, to look at the way that the pagans are, the futility of mind, as if to say, look, that used to be you until Christ became your life. Uh, let's read together in Ephesians chapter 4, from verses 17 to 24, and then we'll pray and jump in. Paul writes, So this I say and affirm together with the Lord, that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk, in the futility of their mind being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. Oh, but you did not learn Christ this way. If indeed you have heard Him and have been taught in Him just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and you put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. That is God's Word to us this evening. Uh, let's go to Him one more time together in prayer. Father, as we look to Your Word to be reminded of Christ as our life, I pray You would use this particular text to move us through the different vantage points that the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to provide. 
that when we look at words like futility of mind and darkened in their understanding, we wouldn't look with noses turned up thinking, yeah, look at the world, look at those pagans, look how they are, but we would remember the such were some of you statements that your word offers. And then in that, uh, for anyone struggling with sin, for anyone in the room who has been being lured in by temptation, for all of us who wrestle with temptation and the influence of this world, may we remember that we have been bought with a price, that Christ is our life, that we are in Him and Him in us, and that would impact the way we live. Sanctify us, consecrate us, keep us focused on eternity, and protect us from the temptations of this world and the danger of claiming Christ but living like the world. Do this in us for your glory and for our good. In Jesus' name, amen. If you profess to be a Christian tonight, then you likely fall into one of these two categories. There are those of you who frequently fall back into old habits of habitual sin or uh, old besetting sins that seem to keep creeping up in various forms. I know if you think about when the Lord saves you, you will notice a pattern of certain things that just go away. I talk to uh, people all the time who were alcoholics and then they get saved, or they were on drugs and they get saved, or they had a, a real foul mouth and they get saved, or they were uh, falling into rampant sexual immorality and they get saved, and those things go away for them. They say, I just don't have a taste for it anymore. I don't want to live that way anymore. I want new friends. I have no desire for these things. But then there's others who would say, yeah, but there are these things that keep coming back into my life. They creep in. I hate them. Why won't they go away like other things went away right away? And there'll be others of you in the room who are less prone to fall into habits of worldly sin, and yet no one is perfect. And sin still comes and knocks at your door, and there are those moments where us, you, all of us, in our foolishness, in our weakness, in our failings, open the door to sin. The Ephesian Christians who would receive this letter would not be unlike you and I. They were a newer church in the epicenter of a bustling city, a port city along the coast of what is now modern-day Turkey. The whole scene around Ephesus would have been filled with captivating worldliness. They would have enjoyed world-class sports, engaging entertainment, wild women, pagan temple worship, thriving business, and certainly too much wine because Paul has to deal with that in the book of Ephesians as well. This means that as Jesus saves people into His church, they didn't exactly have everything figured out. They didn't mature right away, as some denominations in uh, Christendom will say, that you can have entire or perfect sanctification. I have uh, some people in my life I dialogue with, Nazarenes, and they're always talking about they're, they're perfect sanctification. I say, how's that going for you? Uh, there's some Word of Faith preachers that'll tell you the same thing. You know, I haven't sinned in 12 years. I've really reached it. You can too. And there's always a price tag attached to it or some weird school you have to pay tuition for. And <laughs> you know, the Ephesian Christians are, are a lot of them first-generation Christians. They weren't catechized. They didn't go to Awana. They didn't grow up in church. And because they didn't have a great deal of exposure to these things, they would be drawn to Christ with a number of old habits or temptations, like Corinth, who Paul, remember, he still calls them saints, which is a reminder to us that when people are wrestling with sin, and certainly when you're wrestling sin, you know, maybe some of us would have you know, called all of Corinth false converts. 
Paul still calls them saints, but he rebukes them and calls them to repentance. Now, in the second letter, we see that there was a turn, but perhaps some of the Christians in Ephesus would succumb to the temptation to drunkenness. They certainly would have needed help with marriages and the reworking of a Christian marriage dynamic versus a pagan marriage dynamic. So Paul deals with that in chapter 5. A parenting relationships, work relationships. They didn't always know how to worship God properly. They would have dipped back into old habits or been tempted by the world around them. You think about when they come out of the pagan world and suddenly they're in this group of people and maybe the, the, the shine of it all starts to wear off a little bit or they're tempted to think, you know, it looks like they're having a better time out there. It looks like the world is winning. Maybe this isn't the best route. Or maybe I could live in both worlds. I could have one foot in uh, my little Oikos house church and, and one foot out there, and then I could be more accepted. A lot of people try to take that route today. But this issue isn't just at this time prevalent. It's prevalent in our day as well. Christians wrestling with the notion of life in Christ and Christ as our life. Temptation, ever-present, worldly influences, whether subtle or more obvious, creep into our lives, and soon we forget that our life, if we are a true believer, should be growing more and more into the likeness of Christ, not by way of perfection, but certainly by way of progression, we are prone to earthly pursuits, overshadowing eternal perspective. We all, I don't care who you are and how long you've been saved, we all need a renewal of the mind and a refreshing perspective from the Word of God that when Christ is our life, our life will look like Christ. And that's where we pick things up as Paul contrasts very two different realities, and these will be helpful for us under two different headings. I want us to consider the old life without Christ, and then we'll look at the new life with Christ. In verse 17, Paul says, so this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you no longer walk or live just as the Gentiles also walk. That's his point. He's come off three chapters of gospel-saturated doctrine. He's given them all the truth. You are chosen. You are loved. You are redeemed. There is an inheritance waiting for you. There is a pledge through the Holy Spirit in chapters, uh, chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. The Holy Spirit's been given to you. He is a seal. In other words, you are branded. You are marked. God's the, the truly saved will stay saved. You're not going anywhere. He's given them all the glorious truths about life in the church and the mystery now revealed, being one in Christ, that He's building it, and He's built it, Ephesians 2.20, on the foundation of the prophets and the apostles, and Christ is the cornerstone, and now you being a holy temple unto God, you're being built up atop that. Side note, one of the reasons we don't need any more apostles, you don't want to be digging them up and redoing them. You don't need to redo a foundation laid by Christ. He's the cornerstone, and we're being built up. So this is a, a group that understands the truth of the gospel. All of it has been laid clear before them, and now they got to live it. And so Paul calls them to that. I want you to understand that this uh, portion of the text has a very serious tone. Uh, Paul has a number of words at his disposal, but the word say, it's like I declare, it's a solemn tone. And he says, with the Lord, in other words, when I bring this to you, dear Christians, I've brought someone to the table with me. You know, my wife and I do this. When we have uh, loving marital debates, we have these fun little arguments. You know what I'm talking about, where you're convinced you're right, man, but she's convinced she's right, and you got a stalemate. Then you start to hear the wisdom of older men saying, just say she's right. 
Say yes, dear. And so we have, in the midst of our marriage, come up with a system for settling the score. If she brings something or I bring something, one of us may say, hmm, that sounds interesting. Usually it's, hmm, that sounds dogmatic. You got any friends you can bring to the table on that one? And so what we're looking for is usually dead guys. She says, yeah, my friend Charles is with me on this one. You might know him as Spurgeon. I might come to her with something and say, yeah, my sister Liz. You might know her. Elizabeth, Elliot. You know, you bring a friend to the table. Well, this is Paul coming to them with strong commands and clear exhortative imperative directives. And what he does is he says, I, I say this, and I affirm it together with the Lord. Christ is calling you to walk no longer as the Gentiles walk. The idea of walk. You see this in uh, Galatians 5 as well in verse 16 when he says, walk by the Spirit and you will no longer carry out the deeds of the flesh. The word walk, Greek word peripateo, means to go about your business, to be busy about, to be here, there, and everywhere doing this thing. And in Galatians 5, he says, walk by the Spirit means to be preoccupied, obsessed with, wrapped up in the things of the Spirit, what the Holy Spirit would direct you to do, which is, of course, going to be in line with the Word of God. He's saying that you no longer walk, go about your life the old way, the worldly way. And I wonder how many people in churches think, you know, God just loves me. He understands me. You know, He's good with me living this way. He gets it. God gets me. You see the little commercials during all the football games? He gets us. I'm good the way I am. I don't need to change. Come as you are. It's been taken way too far. Yeah, okay, God loves you just the way you are. Yep, He died for you and loved you while you were still yet a sinner, but He loves you too much to leave you the same way you were. He always changes you. Grace is not a license to sin. It, it's transformative. That's how you really can know, by the way, if you're saved. Are you changing? It might be agonizingly slow, but the Lord will do His work. Some people in our life, they wish it were faster. They're praying for it to be faster. That's why God gives us patience for one another and love for one another, which is also in chapter 5 when He says, walk in love just as Christ also loved you. Hear the call. is not just to say you believe and say God loves you, but to live in a way that reflects true love from Him and for Him, which will always lead to action. Paul comes to this point knowing he has been clear about salvation, security, and sanctification. They're a part of the body of Christ. They've been given these amazing gifts. They're blessed with spiritual blessing. So now he brings in the strong words. Hey, he bought you. Now live like he owns you. And verse 17 continues, in the futility of their mind. He's given them a, a, a glimpse back, perhaps convicting though for those who were uh, going back into those cycles of sin. The word futility means emptiness purposelessness. This is a way of thinking that resembles a, a cul-de-sac. You know those people, they just round and round, maybe that's you now or it was you, down a dead-end road and round and round you go. This is the worldly way of living. It's a revolving door. He says in verse 18 then, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God. Now, even though the Gentiles had many idols and their many philosophers seemed impressive, all of their understanding was darkened. Their best hypothesis was nothing more than trying to navigate a deep, dark cave where there is no light, and they strike a single match and think they'll know where to go. Without the light of Christ, their life was still overshadowed by darkness. I think of how impressed people are, especially men today, with Joe Rogan and Jordan Peterson and Ben Shapiro and these men who are conservative and they say true things. For certain, they're fascinating. But they, like the philosophers of the Gentiles, 
are clever, they're intriguing, they're devoted to seeking wisdom, but they're always looking for something new. They're still lost in a dark cave unless they have Christ. That's the number one thing that they need, the number one person. Romans 1.22 says, these are those who professing to be wise, they became fools. This is so many people in our world today. They're excluded from the life of God. It means they're alienated from God. And think about how opposite that is from the Christian who's considered an alien. We're considered exiles. That's what Peter calls Christians because our citizenship is in heaven and we belong to Christ. So we don't exactly fit in in this world all the time. We're kind of weird and we're supposed to be. Well, these Gentiles... They're, they're right at home in the world. They fit in perfectly, like a, a glove or a puzzle piece. You look at the world and the Gentiles fit in just as they ought to. Well, that makes them an alien to God. They're foreign. They don't fit. They're outside of His will. They're outside of His kingdom. And there's two reasons that Paul gives for this. You look at it first there, he says, because of the ignorance that is in them. And then he says, because of the hardness of heart. And, you know, you reread that and, and we might first think, oh, they're just ignorant. They don't have the right information. We need to just tell them. But he's not referring to ignorantly lost people who have never really heard the gospel. Look at the context surrounding the statements he's making here. Hardness of heart, there's callous. Look at verse 19, and they have become callous. And then you keep going in verse 19. They've given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. So there's a progression here. They're culpable rejectors of Christ, lovers of the world. Their ignorance is a willful ignorance. They're enjoying their life. They have a hardness of heart. They think they know. It's shades of Romans 1 being given over. The hardness of heart there, the idea of being obstinate, stubborn in their ways. It is good for you and I to look back on our life and reflect on those moments when we were so stubborn and obstinate towards the gospel. If anything, it brings a a humility and a gratitude and a thanksgiving. It brings a remembrance. You think about the warnings to the churches in the book of Revelation, in Revelation 2, and you think about the warning to go back to first love. It's important we make the connection that that's Ephesus. In all of Scripture, particularly the New Testament, besides Israel in the Old Testament, who got more warnings than your rebellious child over the course of their entire life. Perhaps Ephesus got the most opportunity, and they had some of the best leaders, Paul, Timothy, John. I mean, how, how many more awesome church leaders do you need? They should have had a string of of just faithful legacies after faithful legacies and their children and children and children, and they're getting the warning to go back to what? Their first love. I think there's a temptation to forget and, and to get caught in the, the cruise control Christianity, whether that's a, a bit of a pompous knowledge, like I know doctrine, we've got theology, and it can become this religious exercise Or those who just think, "Ah, you know, I'm fine. I prayed the prayer. I'm good. I punched my ticket. I'm set. Once saved, always saved. I remember. I walked that aisle. I prayed the prayer. He loves me. No matter what, he, he loves me. And they love those songs where... He, he loves them, and He loves them so much, and He's chasing them down, and His love is so reckless. God's like a bull in a china shop, just running into everything to get to you. He's a Jesus with His fingers crossed, 
just hoping, like the kid getting picked last in dodgeball or baseball, just, oh, I hope they pick me. This is a blasphemous view of Christ. His blood accomplishes exactly what it was shed for. His death wasn't wasted. Well, there's people who view him that way. In all of this, it's good to remember, isn't it, that if it wasn't for him, you wouldn't be saved. If it wasn't for his love, you wouldn't be loved. If it wasn't for his mercy on you to condescend, to become truly man, to die in your place, just to know you, what a privilege. And suddenly, we're humbled because we look at these phrases, the ignorance, the hardness of their heart, having become callous, giving themselves over to sensuality, the practice. That's a lifestyle of every impurity and greed. What other response would it invoke but worship if you're saved and repentance if you're not? That Jesus would come and call me to himself. These Gentiles are know-it-alls in their own eyes, and yet they're blind to their great need for Christ. Having become callous, what is that? It's the idea of being so hardened that sin no longer bothers you. And we need to be careful in our own lives to search our hearts. Are there things in your life that you justify? Are there things in your life that used to bother you, you used to feel a, a conviction over them, and they no longer do. If Christ is your life, you ought to be asking those kinds of questions. Lord, where might you be calling me to a deeper level of awareness? Where might you be bringing greater degrees of sensitivity to sin? Where might the Holy Spirit be chiseling away at my calloused heart, my sinful justifications for that behavior and those actions and those words? Where are you calling me to examine? What area of my life? And then you pray. Same prayer that Jesus prayed in Luke twenty two forty two. Your will be done. Have your way. Do it through your word, through the preaching of your word, through people in my life. Don't let me be one of those who have given themselves over to sensuality and for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. And you know, that's how sin works. It lures you in again and again and again. Sin beckons even the believer. It's okay. It's not a big deal. Everybody sins. It's echoes of the father of lies himself in the garden with Eve. Did God really say, surely you won't die? This has been the assault on mankind since the beginning. In 1 Timothy 4, 2, Paul mentions lying hypocrites who have, quote, seared their own consciences as with a branding iron. Why do you think the Bible makes such a big deal about the fear of the Lord? Time and time and time again, the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is what should grip you when you sin. You will sin. I will sin. But do you fear the Lord? Is there a weightiness to it? Do you hate it? Or do you excuse it? Do you repent of it and confess it before the Lord with immediacy and an urgency that I, you want to be right with Him in every way? Many older, wiser men 
have said, the more you fear the Lord, the less room there is for sin in your life. It, it can't kind of take residence and, and camp out. It can't sign a long-term lease and just settle down and be comfortable. Sin should be in your life. Like those restaurants where you get the feeling they're trying to get rid of you. You sit down. Can I get you started on something? You guys ready to order? You get your food. You ordered an appetizer, a bowl of soup or some bread or what have you. And you're, you're just sitting down to enjoy it. But they already put the entree right next to it. You get the hint. Can I get you dessert as well? We can get all out here at once. Sure, why not? Put it all on the table. I'll be gone in five minutes. They want to rotate you through. This is how you should treat sin in your life. It will come to your door. You will wrestle. You will stumble. James says we all stumble in various ways. Nobody is perfect. But the believer does not give themselves over to it, to practice it and to enjoy it and to live a lifestyle of it. The unbeliever doesn't have this healthy view of sin and life and Christ. They don't care what God thinks. They're only concerned with their pleasures and their appetite. Paul lists three terms to give the Ephesians a picture of what he means. You can see him there, sensuality. This is a behavior that is typically related to sexual excess. Uh, it's also called licentiousness in other New Testament passages. This is immorality in that sense. But just to make sure he covers all of it, he says, and every kind of impurity. It's a wide range of filth. It describes the way that pagans live. It also describes the way that God views sin, impurity, filth, wickedness. It's a recipe for disaster when left unchecked and unconfessed. It's completely against His will. And the Gentiles, they're callous towards God and their sin. They don't care. He says greediness. It's the idea of always wanting more. Remember the famous question asked to Rockefeller, how much, how much is enough? Just one more dollar. I always want more. How much sin is enough. The unbeliever says, just, just a little bit more. I just want to experience this. It's like a man I was speaking to not long ago. I, I, I was sharing the gospel with him, and I pleaded with him to place his faith in Christ. And I asked him a series of questions, and he acknowledged it. He understood it. He agreed with me on all of it. And so I said, then, then be saved. Today's the day of salvation. Give your life to Jesus. You're telling me you understand everything I said. Yes. You're telling me you agree that he's the son of the living God, the only savior that could possibly cleanse you of your sins. Yes. That you need to repent. Change your mind. Follow him. Yes. Then come to Christ. He says, I can't yet. I said, why not? He said, there's, there's, there's things I got to do, and I know that if I come to Christ right now, he's going to change that. This is the way the unbeliever operates. Jesus, in all of his goodness, in all of his grace, in all of his mercy, in the glory and beauty of the cross, is still a stumbling block of inconvenience for the unbeliever who loves their sin. This is the essence of total depravity, the Gentile way of life. Like a parasite eating away at you on the inside while you live it up on the outside. It gives the veneer of success and happiness while your heart is rotting underneath the surface. 
Uh, right now, perhaps, even in this very room, there's some who would say, yep, that's me. I'm filled with this Gentile way of living. I know it's futile. Others, you're more self-deceived. You think you're fine, but you're not. There's a warning here. To remember Christ and what He did for you when you were just like this. No matter who you are, no matter how sinful you think you've been or, or how much you know. You know, sometimes the hardest people to reach are the people who think they're saved. And here, you see that there are people who are just shut off. But when Christ truly becomes our life, you will reject that old way. You begin to see with 2020 vision that there's no purpose in it. It's a road that leads to hell, not heaven. And you begin to see that lying to yourself may offer you a few more seconds of relief from that conscience that tells you what you're doing is wrong, which in fact is the Holy Spirit who John says in John 16 will convict the world. You know, everybody experiences some level of the Holy Spirit's work in the world today. Only the believer gets baptized. Only the believer gets filled and sealed and gifted. But there are so many people that experience what Jesus described in John 16, the conviction of the Holy Spirit. It is that uncomfortable moment where at the sound of the gospel and the call to repent, they suppress the truth in unrighteousness, like Romans 1.18 says. But the believer says, guilty. I need him. I can't live without him. I can't go to heaven without him. I'm dying inside. My heart has grown cold, and only that one, Christ, can change me. The believer sees that the only solution is to abandon the depraved life, the dead-end road, the fake Christianity, the self-righteousness, and the lofty view of human philosophy, and trade it all in and turn to embrace a whole new way of thinking and a whole new way of living in Jesus Christ. That is what so many of the Ephesian Christians had experienced. And so Paul has reminded them of the futile way of life, called out the Gentile way of life as a dead-end road and what they were and what they should be careful of in avoiding, and then makes the turn to our second heading, the new life in Christ. Look at verse 20, but you did not learn Christ in this way. You picture him saying, you, you beloved Ephesians, you know better. I've told you. I spent time with you. I stood there on the docks with the elders, and they cried and wept, and we embraced, and I warned them that savage wolves would come in from the inside, but I told them to shepherd the flock of God, and I told them the Holy Spirit is the one who made them overseers. You know the truth. You didn't learn Christ this way. You don't play the game. You don't keep one foot in the world and try to keep one foot in the church if indeed, he says, you have heard him and been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. What is he saying? The plain idea is if you've heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and you've come to know Christ, you're no longer lost, you're found. You're not an ignorant sinner living in a cul-de-sac. He's directed your path, and you're living with purpose and on purpose for His purpose. He's chosen you before the foundation of the world. You are blind, now you see. You are dead, now you're alive. And His encouragement reminds them that they are disciples of Christ and not the world. He is their life. 
Their life is not their own. He says, if indeed you have heard him and been taught. And so it's a matter of putting into practice what you know. It's knowledge applied. It's not enough to just sit in church and be under even great preaching. I talked to uh, somebody not long ago. We were having a discussion about their spiritual life. And they said to me, yeah, we're, I said, do you go to church? They said, yeah, we're at a great church. So-and-so, here, there. Okay, great. We're under, we're under world-class preaching, they told me. I said, wonderful. It's wonderful. And I got that feeling. It's a pastoral intuition. It's like an extra spiritual gift that's not on the list, I think, sometimes. And you can feel the tension on their end. It's like your kid when you catch them and their voice goes, yeah, 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 no, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you go, I, you're, there's something going on here. <laughs> and they've, they've thrown all of the, the flares out. So I, I, I get distracted by them. You're under world-class preaching. Wow. Maybe I'll change the topic. You're at a good church. Awesome. And I said, are you being discipled? Well, no, you know, not really. I, it's, you know, are you, are you attending all the time? Well, it's hard, you know, we got a lot going on in our life, but, you know, we, we catch it online, and, but man, you know, it's, and, and you start digging deeper, and you realize that, I don't know the number, but on any given week in America, there are myriad of Christians who are content with saying they go to church somewhere. You know, I, I came out of madness, and so I had no clue what the SBC was. Some would say it was from madness to madness, but without the heresy sometimes. But no offense. I went to an SBC seminary at first, so we're, we're good. Um, and my undergrad, too. And I didn't know what a Southern Baptist was or the convention or anything like that. And I remember a friend of mine explaining to me how church worked. I said, so how many people are at your church? He said, well, what do you mean? Well, he had a, he's southern. He said, well, what do you mean by that, brother? I said, well, how many people go to your church? He said, well, you, it depends how many are on the rolls or how many are in the pews. And I said, what does that mean? I need a translator. <laughs> you know what membership is? No. Apparently, you can have 1,200 people on the member rolls, but you show up on a Sunday and there's like 212 in the seats. So many people say, yeah, he's my life. But when you look at their life, you can't find Christ. Paul says, if you've been taught, if you've heard, true disciples are all in. They don't straddle the line of worldliness and claim a little Jesus on the side. Verse 22, he says, in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self that's being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit. He's saying there's no value in a worldly lifestyle, none. There's not one redeeming quality. Like a broken clock that's right twice a day, you wouldn't keep using it just because it had two times in a 24-hour period that it was right. So too, you don't need to hold on to any aspect of your old corrupted life. It's all of Christ for all of your life. Every area. There's no compartmentalized Christianity, you know, like the Titanic, thinking you won't sink. You'll just close off different compartments. Eventually, your life is going under. It's all of it for him. And when Christ is your life, it changes the way you live, and it changes the way you think. That's why he says, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. 
Notice that before verse 24, when they're commanded to put on the new self, he says, be renewed in your mind. In other words, you can't have a changed life until you have a changed mind. Because the way you think dictates the way you live. So you've got to get here first. That's why spiritual warfare. It's not, you know, kicking over rocks and looking for the devil around every corner and rebuking him out of your morning traffic and because the coffee maker didn't turn on and I rebuke you, devil. You know, not today, Satan and all this weird stuff people say and put on mugs and bumper stickers. Like everything is spiritual warfare now. Spiritual warfare is a battle for your mind. It's through lies and deception. It's through deceitful schemes, principalities and powers of darkness working through other means than you might think. The devil doesn't show up at the foot of your bed with a pitchfork and a red tail saying, here I am to deceive you. He's subtle. He's a cheap shot artist. It's guerrilla warfare. And he goes for the mind. That's why he goes for the thinking of our children in education systems. That's why he would rather target leaders and teachers and politicians. Why? Because they influence the minds and the thinking and the decisions and the habits and patterns of people. And so what do you think Paul goes for? The mind. That's where we wage war. What's the renewal of the spirit of your mind? If we use uh, Scripture to interpret Scripture here, we find this being a common phrase in Paul's letters. It's pretty thematic. In Colossians 3.10, he says, Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self, same idea, with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. So knowing the creator, knowing God, and understanding your God is the key or one of the keys to the renewed mind. A few verses later, Colossians 3.16, he adds, let the word of Christ dwell within you richly. The idea that knowing your creator doesn't come from some ethereal search, but an objective study of the word of God. Hearing his voice through the scriptures fills the Christian, leads to a Christ-exalting life with a mind that is centered on the will of God. And prior to both of those statements, in Colossians 3.10 and, and verse three, uh, ver chapter 3, verse 16, right in the beginning of chapter 3, verses 1 to 4, Paul says, therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, so if you're alive in him, keep seeking the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. For what? You could say, because it translates, because you've died. You don't live anymore. But your life is hidden in Christ or with Christ in God. And he says, when Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. In other words, if you're truly saved, you set your mind on eternal things, not the things of this world. You want to have an impact while you're here. Yes, but only as an ambassador, only as far as you can make an impact for who? Christ, not yourself. You're not here to build your kingdom. You're here to build his. And so the idea is everything you do centers on Christ, and everything you have centers on Christ. And if Christ is your life, it changes everything. The way you view purpose, why are you here? Your life is not your own. You've been bought with a price, and so you glorify him with your body. The way you view money, it's not your money, it's his money. We're just the managers. He's the God who owns a cattle on a thousand hills. He owns it all. He just lends it to you for a little while as a steward to use it for his glory. And so you even see what he gives, like the book of Deuteronomy when Israel's getting prideful and God reminds him, it's I who gave you the ability to earn wealth. There's no such thing as a self-made Christian, no, everything you have from your salvation, the spiritual resources to your material possessions, your physical blessings from God, all of it belongs to him. So all of life 
for all of Christ means you're more interested in your eternal portfolio than you are in your earthly one. And the question gets convicting for all of us. Whatever your level of wealth today, you are looking at what God has given and saying, how might I steward this for your glory? What do you want me to do? And you go to the Word and you do it. It changes the way you view the church. It's not a Sunday activity. People say, I, I, I really love Jesus. I just don't like people. You know, I am the church. I don't need to go to church. All of these things are deficient views, rebellious views of the church. You begin to look at people the way he does, so it changes your view of people. You begin to look at the church like he does. You know, he, he died for that bride you say you don't like. You want to love it the way he loves it. Don't say you love him if you don't love what he loves. You tell me, Costi, I, I love you. I just hate your wife. We're going to have a problem. <laughs> you love what he loves. You're all in on what he gave his life for. It'll change the way you view sin. Sin is no longer uh, just a, a, a little struggle. You think about the way that a lot of today's kind of pop Christian influencers talk about sin. In my particular area, I don't know how it is for you, but Andy Stanley has a lot of influence on people, and so he coaches a lot of pastors in my area in Phoenix because we have a lot of mega churches, and he seems to know how to build uh, big circuses under the glory of man. And so he comes and coaches them on how to herd more people into the building. But he underestimated the power of the Holy Spirit. And some of those men started to feel convicted about the way he was talking about sin. See, even they knew this has gone a little too far. As Andy began to coach them, he said, you know, we no longer call homosexuality sin at our church. It's a disease. And imagine you telling people they got to turn from their homosexuality and repent of their homosexuality. That's like taking a crippled person's wheelchair away from them. You wouldn't do that. They can't walk. In the same way, you can't tell these people to repent of something they can't control. When Christ takes over, it doesn't matter what the church growth gurus say you should say about sin. All that matters is what does my Lord call it? And you can be loving while you do that. You could be kind while you do that. We don't have to be angry and kind of eye twitching and, and feisty. It's just simple. What does the Lord call it? That's what I'm going to call it, which then would impact the way you view the truth. Truth is not relative. It's absolute. And then it impacts the way you view emotions. Your feelings don't drive the bus. Your faith does. Your trust in the Lord. You've thrown yourself upon Him completely and wholly. All feelings, all emotions, all experiences are filtered through the Word of Christ. And then it'll impact the way you view relationships, your marriages, your friendships, your courtship, your children and parenting. All of it changes because of your life in Christ. And isn't he good to do that and work through you and others? It'll change the way you view your work. Your job now can become a, a, a sacred act of worship unto God. You know, worship isn't just in the building on Sunday. All of life is worship for the Christian. Worship is a lifestyle. You going to work under the glory of God. You being a light wherever He's put you under the glory of God. Everything you do, all of life is worship unto your Creator. When Christ is your life, that is how we live. Everything is His. And then it'll impact the way you view the future, the way you hope, the way you suffer, the unwavering spirit of the Christian who knows who they belong to.
Paul is the premier example of this to them and to us. Philippians 1.21, to live is Christ. To die is gain. In other words, while I'm here, it's all in and all out for Christ because he is my life. But if I go to be with him, what could be better? That was the whole point. He's my treasure. Heaven wouldn't be heaven without him. I want to be with him. Wherever he is, that's where I want to be because he's everything. This is Paul's way of life. Recently, my my seven-year-old daughter, who's been asking big questions in life, at very inconvenient times, by the way, but I'll take it. We're having some father-daughter time one evening, and just recently, this is about a week ago, and she said, Daddy, when people die, like if you die, it gets so personal. <laughs> I liked it when it was people. It's kind of a good thing. I said, is it now? <laughs> How? And she said, well, whether it's you or even me, if we die, even though everybody here is sad, and maybe, you know, you would miss me or, or I would miss you and we wouldn't have father-daughter dates now, I would be with Jesus. And so the other person isn't sad because they're with Jesus. And really, we could be happy because you're with Jesus. So it's really not that bad. And I thought, if only we could just stay this way. (laughs) You know, the book of Romans has good wisdom, mourn with those who mourn. Book of Ecclesiastes tells us there's a time to mourn, but when your life is all wrapped up in Christ, you know, even death, where's your sting? Even the final breath, while it's filled with tears, because we are given these relationships and we do love each other and we are supposed to love each other and and these are good gifts and it is tragic and sad when certain things happen, whether it be children, the elderly, a spouse, a a parent, it, it doesn't matter. The pain of loss is real, but the hope for the Christian is an even greater reality. Unbelievers fear death. I remember growing up, we weren't allowed to talk about death in my house. If you said, but what if someone were to die? The whole table would erupt. In Jesus' name, there'll be no death in this house. We pray a hedge of protection around this house in Jesus' mighty name. Get the oil. We're going to anoint this place with oil. (laughs) Nothing's going to touch this house. The spirit of death's not coming over this house in Jesus' name. Ah, And they all start doing the TBN stuff. And and you're you're thinking, (laughs) why can't we talk about death? And I I love my family. I I want them to know the truth and and love the Lord. But in the Word of Faith movement, in the prosperity gospel, in circles where there is rampant unbelief, whatever they say on TV or on YouTube or wherever, let me tell you, people who don't know the true gospel, they know it in their heart of hearts that they're not saved. They're so scared of death. They're trying to hold on. But when your life is all wrapped up in Christ, you say like many believers do, I'm ready to go whenever he's ready for me. I'm ready for him. Why? Because to live is Christ, but to die is gain. And so do you say you love him? Do you say you know him? You say you're his disciple? Then all of your life should look like him. And your mind is to be renewed. And the true believer is always in a state of constant renewal. That's what so many of these imperative verbs are. They're they're present active verbs in which the, the Christian is always being renewed. You wake up each morning needing the the filling of the Holy Spirit and the direction of His Word and the intercessory prayer ministry of Christ on your behalf. Every day you and I need Him. 
And in that, we can even find that life in Christ is filled with a dependency and a recognition that you and I are never there on our own strength. We've never arrived. We need Him every hour. We need Him. And with a transformed heart and a renewed mind, verse 24 says to put on the new self, which is in the likeness of God, and has been created in righteousness and the holiness of truth. This is where holiness is found. You want to be more righteous. You want to be more holy. It doesn't come from a brow-beating command. Stop doing that. Quit being so sinful. You wretched Christian, you. It's be renewed in your mind. Love him more than anything. You know, affection is where change begins. So do you love him? Is he everything to you? Can you live a day without caring about what he thinks, about what he wants? Uh, for Paul, Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. The new self is in the likeness of God in righteousness and holiness of the truth. And to understand this fully, we, we need to remember we are created in the image of God, and then sin ruined the perfection of God's creation and corrupted the human race. And God, who is holy, deals with sin in only one way, death. And all of mankind would be forever condemned, but God, being rich in mercy and love, sent His Son Jesus to die in the place of sinners. He was the perfect and sinless sacrifice to redeem God's people. He fully took the wrath of God upon Himself, satisfying the justice of God. And so when you place your faith in Him as Savior, you then receive His righteousness. And so when God the Father looks at you, He does not see a filthy, wretched sinner, but for those who are in Christ, He sees the righteousness of His Son imputed to you. That kind of confidence is only available to those who have placed their faith in Christ. So how do you know if Christ is your life? The gospel is your gospel. Christ is your Savior. His substitutionary atoning death is yours. The sin you used to love you now hate. The holiness that you never desired you now seek by His grace working through you. This is life in Christ, and this is what it means for His power to bring dead sinners to spiritual life, and praise God, He's made it available to us, His bride through Christ. Let's pray. Father, we are a forgetful people, so thank You for the reminders in Your Word. We're also prone to pride, and we begin to think we are more than we ought to, and Your Word brings us back to a place of renewal and remembrance that we're nothing without You, and that we're here because of You and ultimately for You. Help us to remember Christ, to relish in Christ, and to live all of life for Christ. Thank you for your mercy and your love upon us, your chosen people, that we once were sinners, and now you call us saints, all because of Christ. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.